All right, uh, sit down. Okay, glad to see so many of you. Um, today is the final you know, episode, the final series in our Jesus Christ, the Gospel. And today, you know, my title is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. So with that, I think, let's just greet your neighbor, your left and your right, and just say Merry Christmas and peace be with you. Merry Christmas and peace be with you. Just a, a fun fact. Um, you know, if you're attending the Catholic Mass, that is something that you will say every week, you know, peace be with you. I grew up in a Catholic family, go to Catholic church, so I'm very familiar with this rite. They call the rite of peace. And then um, before they get communion, the priest will say to the congregations, um, may the peace of the Lord be with you all. And the congregation responds, you know, and with your spirit, and then they're going to greet one another. They're going to, you know, shake hands, they're going to hug, and they're going to say, peace be with you. You know, and they do it every week, every Sunday. You know, it's part of their uh, mass. And it was there because it was a reminder that in Christ, we've received peace. You know, peace with God and also peace with one another. And so today, you know, uh, that is what I'm going to share with you, uh, the peace, right? And if you you know, go to Hallmark, if you get a Christmas card, you know, the word peace, I would say majority of the card will have that word, you know, usually peace, love, and joy, and maybe with hope, but it's so strongly correlated, you know, Christmas and peace, and one of the reasons is because the text that we're going to read, you know, because on Christmas, that peace has come into the world. So let's read from Isaiah 9. Uh, verse 2 and then 6 to 7. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has a light dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Consular, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. So this is, you know, first from the book of Isaiah. Uh, this is not written after Jesus was born. In fact, it was written seven, eight hundred years before he is born. So it was a prophecy, prophesy uh, by a prophet named Isaiah. And at the time, you know, the people of Israel were under attack, under occupations. The northern Israel was... Uh, conquered by the Assyrians, and the people are in chaos. People are kind of in, you know, in the dark time, right? And that's why at the time, um, during this tribulation, during this difficult time, you know, God gave these visions to Isaiah. And he said, hey, to those who walk in the darkness, on them a light has dawned. And there will be a son given, and he shall be named Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. That's what we're going to talk about, the Prince of Peace. Um, now, one of the things that my family, I guess my wife, one of her favorite things to do during the Christmas season is to go to a place with Christmas lights. You know, throughout the past five, eight years together, we've gone from San Francisco, San Mateo, San Jose, Dublin, Pleasanton, and all out of the different places, including in New Mexico. Uh, she likes to see Christmas lights. You know, it just now become one of our, I guess, family, we call it family traditions. You know, during Christmas time, we'll try to find a place that has these beautiful Christmas lights. And one of the reasons why, you know, you see so many of these Christmas lights during the Christmas season is because that's prophecy, right? That in that darkness, during the time where there's suffering, the time where there's a lot of um, anxiety and separations and abuse of power, um, 
there is a prophecy that a light has dawned, right? And it is, it indeed has come. And that's why every Christmas season, you see in a lot of places, they, they light up this light. You know, you might, we might not remember anymore why we have that light, but one of the reasons is because that is the promise that the light has dawned to us. But the light, you know, shows its value in the darkness. And what Isaiah is saying that the light come because the people are walking in darkness. The light comes because people are walking in darkness. And of course, when this was given, it's obvious because, again, the, the people of Israel was under attack. Uh, they was under attack from the Syrians, and then afterwards, you know, they're conquered by, by the Rome as well. Uh, but even now, while the situation has been better in a lot of places, in reality, a lot of people are still walking in darkness. Because when the Bible talks about darkness, it doesn't simply talk about, you know, the, the suffering or the injustice or all the bad things that happens in this world or the evil things that happen in this world. The Bible also talks about the ignorance. You know, when the Bible talks about darkness, it talks about the ignorance, the ignorance of people, the ignorance of what is it that's causing the darkness? What is it that's causing all the suffering, all the sadness, and how can this darkness be kind of eliminated, right? How can we get rid of this darkness? And in the past hundred years, you know, if you're walking back to the 18th century, 19th century, when science really uh, made a forefront, you know, there's a season or a period called the Enlightenment period and then the modern period where technology really advanced. I know the past few years has been crazy, right? Like, oh, you know, solar uh, energy, nuclear energy and everything. But then um, that has been going on in the past 100 years. And during the 18th and 19th centuries, where, you know, technology really started to develop, uh, a lot of the thinkers, a lot of people, you know, that uh, the philosopher, uh, they believe that within a few hundred years, you know, with educations, with technology that they will able to create utopia. You know, the world where there is no sadness, the world where everyone is happy, and technically the world without this darkness. And how disappointed they are when they found out that the 20th century become the bloodiest century in the world. You know, with the World War I and World War II, a lot of those people who believe in that, you know, everything that is needed you know, for us to create this utopia, to create this heaven on earth, is just a more uh, smart person, just more educated, just a better technology. A lot of them are getting so disappointed in their belief because of what happened. And it's rightly so because uh, as Paul says, whoops. Because as Paul says in Romans, I think the problem is not simply educations, right? The problem is not that people need to be, you know, get a master degree or a PhD, just be smarter. Uh, Paul says that the problem is with the human heart. You know, the human heart, in simple terms, need a new heart, you know. Let me just read the first verse. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this is what he said, the word dark again. Their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, what Paul point out and what, you know, God is telling us throughout the Bible is that the problem with the world, you know, this darkness, is not simply just a matter of a better technology. It's not simply a matter of a better education. It's not that people need to think smart and act smart because if you read history, a lot of the, the bad deeds, you know, the war, the, the killing and the bad things in the world, the perpetrators oftentimes are the smarter people, you know, who, who's created the, the, ed, the um, 
you know, the nuclear bomb, that was the smartest um, researchers. So what we reminded today and what we're celebrating on Christmas, you know, about this peace, peace come upon the earth, is that we need to remember that the light that come, the peace that come from God is something outside of us. There is God that came into this world. And the reason why every, every uh, Christmas, you know, we have the light, we, we decorate the trees. Uh, does anyone know why we decorate the Christmas tree? Just curious. And I told you the light is because, you know, a light has come into this world. But why do we decorate the Christmas tree? Uh, it's it's to, to some degree to bring back, um, you know, if you remember in, in Genesis, right, Ad, Adam and Eve eat from the tree the fruits, the forbidden fruits, and that become a cursed world. And then on Christmas, from what, you know, Jesus has come and what he's done, you know, we restore the, um, I guess, rest heaven become accessible again you know they restore the tree to some degree you decorate the tree um, because now it's no longer a curse right the christ has been cursed at the tree and now you have life from the tree because christ has that in the in the cross anyway that's just a, a, a side story but what i really want to say with you is that we often say oh christ is the reason for the season right christ is the reason for the seasons and it is true, because in that darkness, that God, our God, is not a God who just leave it as it is, right? He doesn't create and then just leave the people, okay, whatever you do, you can have fun. You know, or, he, or he also not the God who just put his justice, you know, and destroy the whole world. You have messed up, now I'm going to, you know, destroy everything. The God that we believe, the triune God, you know, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit is the God of love. God of justice. So when his kids, you know, us, his creations, has rebelled against him, you know, even though it's very clear in the Bible, it, you know, there's a lot of, you know, search the word of wrath or anger. There's so many things because God is angry about all this suffering, you know, all this darkness that kind of invading his creations, you know, the evil that has been happening. But at the same time, he doesn't leave it as is. He doesn't simply come to judge and destroy, but he himself come. He gives himself to redeem the people. He gives himself so that we can be saved. For us, a child is born. For us. It is for us that God comes into this world. And again, in Rome, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we know and stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Why is it so important to have this peace with God, right? Isn't all our problems is just, you know, a peace with other people? Isn't war just cause between two people, cause between two nations? Why is it that so important? You know, in the Bible, it's written multiple times that the problem is not simply, you know, be a better person, just simply follow the law. It's because... It's our sinful natures because our rebellious rebellions against God that that is the root of all this problem and that's why even though now we live in the in the era with the most PhD the most smartest person the most advanced technology there's still war there's still killing in different areas there's still injustice and suffering because you can erase this darkness can't have peace with one another when your heart itself is tainted with sin. And it is through his coming, you know, through God coming, living, teaching us, and then ultimately paid penalty of our sin at the cross that we have this peace. And sometimes when we say Christmas, you know, during Christmas, peace be with you, we forgot 
the peace is not simply just a nice saying like, hey, you know, have peace, be happy, be merry. But the peace that, that we say to one another, the peace that we experience, you know, come at the cost of someone. This is God the Son, right? He has come. That you, we can extend this peace because God has come and pay the penalty of our sins. That all these things that we say in the Christmas, right? Joy, peace, merry, um, happy, you know, all that is from God. You know, who reconciled to us himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, that God is saving everyone, that God was reconciling all this conflict, all this sin, all this injustice, to himself, and he paid the price for himself when he died at the cross. And sometimes I think we, we, you know, we hear this in the pulpit multiple times, that God died for you in the cross, God dies for you at the cross, and then you wonder, like, so what? You know, how, does that, how does that help me living my daily life? How does that help me to, be, to have peace with one another? And what I... You know, what I got from my reflections and what I've tried to apply it on my life is the fact that when God died at the cross, and when I believe that God died at the cross for me, that means I lose the right to be so judgmental of people that I lose the right to condemn people and be angry unnecessarily. And what does that mean? Oftentimes, you know, some of you are married, right? Of course, you have conflict with your wife, with your husband, with your girlfriend, your, your boyfriend, or even with your kids. And so many times I feel like I'm so justified to be angry at my wife. You know, she is wrong. I am right. So many times, you know, of course, in my heated moment, I'll say to my wife in my heart, like, it's not fair. You know, why are you doing this? You should apologize to me. You know, I'm the one being hurt. My ego was so big that I can't, um, I can't see my, my own flawedness. I can't see my own um, ego. And by the grace of God, I think this was like two years ago, and we had a kind of a big argument or something, um, I was reminded, like, why are you so angry? Why are you thinking that your life, that you are so up there, you know, that your wife uh, is so bad, that you, are, that you deserve to kind of be angry and, and punish her, or not, not punish her, punish her, you know, punish her with a silent treatment. You know, that's my, used to be my favorite <laughs> treatment. I'm just, I'm just going to be quiet and put that, you know, just anger face and then just ignore her. But God remind me that I wasn't perfect myself and yet he died for me. Why is it so hard for me to forgive others when God himself has, has died at the cross so that he, he can pay all my sin, pay all my wrongdoings. And I'm, I probably doesn't do justice about, you know, what God revealed to me at the time. But it's from that time that I always remember that during my anger, during the time when I have conflict with people, during the time when I was disappointed with people, but I don't have peace with people, that, that I remind myself you can forgive others because God has forgiven us, because God himself has reconciled, you know, forgiven us and bringing us. And all those people that you point finger at, all those people that you're angry at, all those imperfect people, bad people that you have in your own judgments, they're also children of God. And God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Who are you to judge my other children? Who are you to keep being angry at God's other children? Because that's for me how I keep reminding myself and how it helps me to 
to build that peace with the relationship. Because I think as much as we wish that everyone was, you know, everyone here, you know, your left and right. No, I wish everyone was perfect. Everyone would be like truly loving like God. But the reality is not. And even more so people out there, right? Will be disappointed with people, be angry at people, will disagree with people. But if we hold true to what God has done at the cross, what God has done when he come into this world, and what God has called us himself, right? We are given this ministry of reconciliations. We're called to bring peace to others. And that's why, you know, I start this preaching by saying, say, you know, may the peace be with you. Right? That, is, that is supposed to be our, our default kind of relationship with others, to bring peace to others, because we ourselves have been given peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. In, in John it says, Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but I give it to you. And Jesus also said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So today as we gather here, as we celebrate Christmas, let's Let's remember that the reason that we can celebrate this peace, that we say, oh, peace be with you, is because God himself has made peace with us. God himself has paid the penalty of our sin, our wrongdoing. And he has given us his peace. And we are also called to give peace to one another. But when the Bible talks about peace, you know, some of you might know, the, the, what's the Hebrew word for peace? What's the greeting the Jewish people says to one another? Shalom. Shalom, right? When the Bible talk about peace, it's not simply about the absence of conflict. I think the past few slides, right, I talk about how God has resolved the conflict between us and how we're called, you know, to be a peacemaker, to resolve the conflict with others. But peace is not simply the absence of um, of conflict. And in fact, I think for a lot of us, especially those who live in the US, that is not what we are really struggling with. A lot of us who live in the US, who are lucky enough to be in the US, you know, we don't have war in our neighborhood. You know, we're not fighting against someone who's trying to, to kill you or to, to occupy your, your house or your land, or someone, you know, who's trying to uh, restrict your liberty or freedom for religious actions. I think a lot of us in the U.S. oftentimes doesn't have shalom because of the fear and anxiety. So shalom is, a, again, not just an absence of conflict, but also a, a well-being. It's being whole, wholeness. And of course, when you have conflict, you're not whole, right? You, you, you're having conflict. Uh, but on the other side, to have shalom, to have this peace that God promised you, is also to have a well-being, you know, your mental well-being. And in here, you know, in a simple term, maybe just a simplistic view of it, it's just a peace of mind. And when, when I was reading through that Isaiah and read about Isaiah, well, my wife actually reminded me about how you can have peace in your day-to-day because Isaiah, as I said, was written seven, eight hundred years ago before Christ was born. So it was about, let's just say, 2,800 or 3,000 years ago, right? Um, Isaiah was written seven, eight hundred years before Christ himself was born. God already prophesied. God already promised that there will be someone who bring peace. There will be someone that bring lights to you. And what does that mean? That means he is in control of time and history. And all these things that are happening in our daily life doesn't escape his eyes. In the past, I often worry about my job. I often worry about my future, uh, about my kids, especially if I have kids. You know, I think that the worrisome is getting really real. You know, oh, 
I think I shared this before, when, when Carl was like three years old, you know, what was my worry? I'm worried about, oh, who is gonna, he's gonna date, you know? <laughs> I wasn't a, I wasn't a, a, what do you call it, a nice guy myself, right? So I've heard or not have a good relationship in the past. Um, and so sometimes I, I, I wonder, oh, who's my kids gonna date? You know, I have a girl, I have Emily. And I had this discussion with my wife, oh, when would we allow her to date? When would we allow her to, you know, be close with, with a man? Because we both know that it can be messy. So a lot of us, I think, more than struggling with a conflict, we're struggling with our thoughts, we're struggling with our fear, our anxiety, the uncertainty, oh, what might come. But when I discussed that um, Isaiah with my wife, she reminded me that, do you notice that it was written 800 years ago? And what that means is God has a plan for this world. That as big as he is, as far as he is in your eyes, he cares for us. You know, he hears the cry of his children. And he will make everything beautiful in its time. You know, man cannot understand what God has in mind from the beginning to the end. But I think from what he has done and what he has promised us, we can be sure that our life is in a good hand. Am I still worried? I am. You know, that doesn't mean I'll be in, you know, there's a, there's a worry that compels you to plan, right? Like, oh, I'm worried, but oh, my kids will need some money later when they go to school. But there's some worry that no one, no at you at night will make you cannot sleep, you know, will make you just, you know, have that thought keep running and running and running. And I think having that trust in God, you know, knowing, again, just reflecting on what he has done, how far he has come, you know, he's come into this world as a God. No other religions, you know, in fact, it's blasphemy. If you talk to people in Islam or other religion, it's a blasphemy. You know, how can you think a God comes into this world? But that is how far our God has come for us. And I think that should give us an assurance about our life is in good hands. And the last thing that I stumble upon, kind of interesting, is this psalm. So this is going to be my kind of second slide from the last. And when we talk about a peace of mind, the book of Psalms says, great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. And as I was pondering about it, right, of course, you know, my team is peace, you know, kind of try to understand what the Bible talk about peace. And when I was thinking about it, why, why, why is peace associated with, you know, people who love your law? And I was reminded while I'm driving, the moment I can peacefully drive is the moment when I follow my speed limit. And the moment when I drive kind of frantically and always anxious and looking left and right, looking at my back, is when I'm speeding, when I broke the law. And so when I'm reading back this psalm, it's kind of a reminder that for us to, to live, in, to, to have that peace, right? Because you cannot fool yourself. You cannot just say, oh, you know, it's going to be peace, peace. You have techniques. You can go to Barnes & Noble. You find a lot of techniques to sort of have, you know, superficial peace, right? And just take a deep breath, meditate, control your mind. But I think to really have that that deeper sense of peace, that knowing that, you know, yes, everything that happened is in God's hands, is also to know, is, the way to get it is also to walk in his law. Because in the Bible it says, um, sorry, it blanks. Um, everything turns good for those who believe in him, right? Those who follow him, who do according to his will. And so for us to live in this life, and to have this peace, you know, that underlying peace. Yeah, things might get chaotic, things might get uh, unpredictable, but for you to still have confidence in this life, 
and to say to, to have that peace you can only get it when all you, you're also living your life according to his law because he is our creator but his law is not supposed to constrain us his law is not supposed to to make us miserable which is what I, what I had in mind when I was back you know, years ago like why so many rules it feels like being a Christian is not fun being a Christian is miserable I I already have to spend two hours every Sunday while everyone is doing things. And now there's these things that you need to do. Uh, you need to give uh, tithing, give alms, and whatever, right? All these rules sometimes can feel constricting. It makes you feel that God, what God wants is to us to be miserable. But in reality, that he is our creator, that in, it is in following his rule that we'll be free from anxiety, we'll be free from all the things that control us, that will ultimately bring ruins to our life. And so as I close, you know, I want to extend this shalom, right, this peace to you and for you to reflect on this peace that you can have in your life. I would like to, to welcome you, to, to bring you along you know, in this journey to come to him and adore him. For he is our prince of peace. That he is peace himself. That for those of you, you know, whose heart are in so much burden and um, troublesome. I want to encourage you to welcome him. Because he is the prince of peace. You know, it is in him that we can, can have hope. That we can celebrate. That he is not a God that just angry at you they're just mighty out there judging you but he's a god who has come as a baby you know as vulnerable as it is as humble as it is as dependent as it is you know a baby a baby in a manger not a baby of a king but a baby of a carpenters that is our god and i believe that if god goes to that great length for me for you and i I believe that I can give my life and trust him and to have this peace that he has promised us. Amen. Let's close our eyes and pray. Uh, Father God, thank you so much that we can um, come here and celebrate Christmas. Celebrate